This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Welcome to Us Versus Them, Patients and Caregivers Confront Health Care. I'm Marianne Sterling. Thank you for joining us today. In this episode, we're going to learn a, a lot about a form of dementia that you may not be familiar with. It's called frontotemporal dementia, or FTD. If this sounds familiar, you may recall that a very famous actor was diagnosed with this disease recently. So buckle in. I have two incredible women joining me today for this discussion, Sharon Hall and Amy Johnson, whose husbands were both diagnosed with FTD, but have two very different journeys to share with us today. They've also become two of the best advocates I know. So welcome to you both. Amy, I'm going to start with you. Can you give our listeners a peek at your family's journey with FTD? How did this all start? Well, hi, Marianne. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, My name is Amy, and I kind of began this journey. It was about in 2015 uh, when I had my third son. Um, He was about three months old, and I started just realizing, looking back and trying to figure out why it seemed like my husband was changing quite a bit. Um, I didn't know that the, there was like strange little things, just personality changes. He just seemed a little depressed almost and a little just withdrawn. He didn't really want to hang out with us anymore or do stuff with us and having a newborn, having a baby, that was pretty noticeable. Um, So there was just that it seemed like he kind of became more apathetic and he was starting to say some just strange things, just kind of rude, insensitive. And he had always been just a very warm, loving presence. So to kind of have this kind of cold, um, distant demeanor, it was pretty noticeable for me so that's when I started noticing things Um, by a year a year later I actually ended up you had a field vasectomy and I was pregnant pregnant again and going through that it really was a huge decline within about a year Um, and and right around that time um, you know I was worried about our marriage we went to marriage counseling just really tried to make things work that didn't do much good and um, so our really starting to look for answers and all that began when he lost his job for harassment when I was seven months pregnant. So that's kind of a, a brief overview of where that all started. And Sharon, your journey has been markedly different. Um, give our listeners an idea of how it started and how you arrived at FTD. Part of my journey, I'm Sharon, and part of my journey was similar to Amy's. Uh, there were personality changes and just aggravation that I couldn't explain and just distancing and just totally focused on playing a game online and becoming more and more disconnected until the point where I said something's going on. And one night he went to bed early and I picked up his phone and the I heard it go off, and I picked it up, and there was a text that said, I love you, handsome. And uh, I almost fainted. <laughs> I thought I was going to die because my husband was just the most attentive, romantic person, and it just threw me totally. And uh, I said, who is it? Well, I went to went to bed and he, I couldn't catch my breath. He was like, what's wrong? And I said, well, who is this person? And do you want a divorce? And so that was the beginning of the bad stuff happening. He ended that immediately. I said, we're going to go, I'm going to counseling. You do whatever you want, but if you have a brain, you'll go to counseling because this isn't going to work otherwise. And uh, I went to counseling. He went to counseling. We then went to counseling together. 
and it wasn't working and I could see how much he was trying and it wasn't happening. I also had my mom living with us who had dementia, who had vascular dementia and uh, at the time. And I thought, I have to start putting things away and, and mom and I have to get out of here because this just isn't going anywhere. And so I was on an, an app that had chat and so forth. Uh, because of my mom, I was learning things about caregiving. And there was a video and it was about FTD. And I went, oh my gosh, this is it. His mother was diagnosed with Pick's disease way back in the late 80s, early 90s, and had no idea there were behaviors involved. They were very kind of secretive about that portion of it. And uh, I had no idea what I was looking at. And I thought, this is it. And made an appointment with uh, Emery to go to a place that I knew could diagnose this and not be misdiagnosed because obviously I started looking into it and said, oh, no, we're not going down that rabbit hole and so we went to Emory and then we had a six month away visit and I was after Thanksgiving time I called and I said look you've got to refer me to somebody that knows FTD because he's going to lose his job I this is getting very bad this has to be what it is his mother had it and I don't know what to do and they got me in right away and the first visit it was pretty much mm, we'll do all the testing but I think you could probably say it's FTD. So uh, our journey started a little quicker. I didn't have as much of a lag time, thankfully. It was only about a year of doing all the counseling before I saw the video that made me realize what it was. So um, that that's how our journey sort of started. Amy, how did you get a diagnosis for your husband? What was that journey like? How long did it take and in what roadblocks did you encounter along the way? It took us about eight months to get a diagnosis. And that really only was sped up that fast because of the fact that I was desperate, um, very desperate. I had four little kids under the age of six and um, it just didn't seem like I could get an appointment faster than a month out for all of these things. So I pushed, we we went from family practice doctor to a psychologist to deal with some issues that we thought maybe were, you know, having to do with more like, um, more like pornography, stuff like that. Maybe it's just a midlife crisis. We come back to the family doctor because the psychologist said, you know, you, you don't have anything like wrong with you physically. I mean, like psychological, like, this is, seems like it's more, it seems like it's something with your brain because of the other changes that we've seen, you know, with, with your personality. Um, and there was nothing else to attribute it to, like, you know, drugs or alcohol or an accident or something like that. Uh, so he recommended an MRI. We had that done. But a radiologist read it as opposed to a neurologist. So we, they just said, it's good. We don't know what to do. Um, my therapist recommended neuropsych testing. So I mentioned that to my doctor. He ordered that. We had that done. And the results came back um, split there. They said, well, he doesn't have aggression. He's not angry like you would see with frontal temporal dementia, which I learned later isn't always the case. You don't always have someone with, with those kind of behaviors. They're not always mean and, mean and hurtful. Um, they said it could be schizoaffective disorder of the depressed type because of the fact that that the schi um, schizophrenia does run in his, his mom had schizophrenia. So it, it was just difficult to get, we got to that point and then I, we had some other family stuff going on. My mom had passed away. So I, I just didn't really know what to what to do next, you know, or where to go with that. Um, I eventually tried to get in with another clinic to go see a neurologist, but those were two months out for a wait to get an appointment because I didn't press out. So I finally ended up calling on the phone, just bawling my eyes out. And I said, I can't do this anymore. What's, you know, they said, well, you asked for a specific neurologist. We didn't know you were to get any neurologist. I'm like, just give me somebody. I gotta, I gotta get this figured out. So um, they had me in the two days later. <laughs> A neurologist and they basically didn't they did a bunch of testing and said we'll see you in a month and I said I can't I can't survive another month I don't know what you want me to do they took some more blood tests more blood tests more blood tests and I eventually just I sat down in the office and I said isn't there something you can stick on his head like aren't there nodules or, I don't know what else to do but you're I feel like blood tests are not doing it and he said, well, we are not a teaching hospital, so you would need to go somewhere that does have, the, you know, more resources for that. I would recommend like Mayo Clinic. And so um, 
I had I had asked to have a referral made there then, and so we did that and initially got set up to go see a psychiatrist for medication management. We didn't have, you know, the official diagnosis of FTD yet, so we didn't know how to treat it. Uh, so I went there for a psychiatrist psych, psych, psych intake appointment, and they referred me almost immediately to neurology. We had the that testing done with them. They ordered another MRI because it had been six months since the first one. That one they had read by a neurologist, and they said, we're pretty sure that this is, you know, frontal temporal dementia, um, which I wasn't entirely shocked because that had come up on the preliminary neuropsych testing as a possibility. Um, and with the decline being so marked, I, I had a feeling that was what it was. So we, we ended up doing the um, PET scan as well, which was absolutely horrific. <laughs> Trying to get someone that is so progressed with FTD to do any testing is exhausting. Just even telling them they can't eat something for so long. Oh, man. <laughs> or you can only eat certain things. You have to lock things up. <laughs> It was a lot. I remember that that has, or the hotel overnight stay very vividly. <laughs> um, but after the PET scan, that uh, that was what we ended up getting that final diagnosis, and they just told me, "Well, get your affairs in order. There's not really much else we can do. We're not needing to see you again unless you feel like doing some sort of, you know, if you wanted to do a trial. Here's the, how do you find a trial? So, and he was pretty far progressed at that point that I didn't feel like that was going to be an option for us. And what I'm hearing here from you is that persistence is key uh, in both of your cases. I want to take a step back for a moment for our listeners and talk about, Sharon, help us understand how FTD is different from other forms of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, because there's a, there's some similarities, but there are a lot of differences. Help us out here. The similarities don't become apparent until pretty much the end. Uh, at, at the end of any dementia, they all pretty much look very similar. But in the beginning, FTD, you have a healthy, robust person, like Amy's, Amy's uh, husband was young, and mine was young for Alzheimer's, <clears throat> and they look physically fine. It's not what people think dementia looks like and uh, they can pretty much fake it for a while and you don't even know anything is wrong but with FTD it I always say when someone is not who they were think neurology not psychology because the change in personality with FTD is one of the key things that almost everyone sees in the behavior variant which is most prominent the uh, primary progressive aphasia that has to do with language and sometimes they have behavior sometimes they don't but uh, and the movement disorders obviously they have movement difficulties so that's a little bit easier to tell but the behavior variant like Amy said is this midlife crisis whatever the heck that is that's not in the DSM and uh, you just are grasping at straws. You think, well, you know, they turned into a jerk. I just thought Rod became this jerk overnight. I was like, I don't know what happened to you, but obviously you turned into a jerk. And it's that change of personality with FTD. That's why it's always, that's why I tell people, if someone is not who they were, because let's face it, it takes a lot of psychotherapy for you to change your basic personality. That takes a lot to change what you basically believe in and what you basically have always held as your moral code. And that kind of goes out the window with FTD. And people are thinking that it's all this other psychological thing going on. But it's worth checking out the neurological first and make sure that you go to a teaching hospital that knows dementias and you know that, that you're checking off that box before you go into the black hole of going to psychology and you're with a therapist for heaven knows how long and not getting anywhere. So the difference is that huge change of personality and it's subtle at first. It's very subtle at first, but you can look back and say, oh, I bet you that was, I bet you that was. But when it gets to the point where this is like, this is not the person I married, and this is not the person I known. That's a red flag. And I want to be very clear here for our listeners. 
Amy, what age was your husband when he was diagnosed with FTD? Um, he was 36 when I started seeing symptoms and 38 at diagnosis. 38 with the official diagnosis. Let that sink in. Sharon, how about your husband? He was 62. His mother was diagnosed about the same time. But as we looked back after diagnosis, we could go back solid five years. And in some cases, there were things 10 years earlier that were a little bit quirky. And you went, oh, wow, what'd you say? Uh, so in looking backward, you can find it way sooner than when you actually start seeking an answer. And that's why we're talking about this topic today, FTD. I want to emphasize to our listeners, this is not an old person's disease, whatever you consider old, okay? <laughs> this is striking people in the prime of their lives, okay? I want that message to really sink in. And Amy, you've alluded to some of this, but I, I want you to talk about some of your most challenging interactions with the healthcare and social services systems. And the, the, the challenges uh, that, that you all have faced because so many people with FTD, because they're under the age of 65, literally fall through the cracks. Yeah, I struggled a lot, especially, I mean, I felt like it was difficult leading up to diagnosis. But after diagnosis is where I really struggled because I felt like leading up to this terminal diagnosis, I mean, they tell you you have two to two, 10 years to live. They said he would be closer to the two. And they were about right. It was about three years after diagnosis before he passed away. Um, but they basically just let you loose. And they, they say, get your affairs in order, but they don't tell you what that means. So I start looking. I tried calling, you know, like... Some, uh, the Association for Functional Some Rural Dementia, they said contact social services. I tried contacting social, social services. They say, financially, you guys are too well set off. You can't qualify for anything. So I'm like, well, then who do I, what do I do? I can't keep him home. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, you know, so then I tried starting to look into, like, assisted living. Well, then they required you to fill out some other, pay, you know, go talk to the area agency on aging. aging. So I contact them, and they say, well, he's not old enough to have dementia, so we can't help you. And I said, well, who am I supposed to call? Well, social services. <laughs> like, well, I talked to them and they told me to call you. I, I don't know where I'm going here. Who am I supposed to talk to? And everywhere I went, they said he has to be 55. And I said, well, he is 38. And he cannot live here with my kids and I anymore. They said, well, can he go to a, can he go to a group home? And I said, no, because they would let him out the door. He could walk away. And they were like, well, is he not safe? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if he's safe or not because he's being crazy. I don't know what to do with that. Um, so there really wasn't any place for them to, for him to go. There wasn't anybody to really like, take him under. I found out after he had been placed in a facility for a year that at that point, what I should have done was to hire my own social worker. But I had no idea. What they were telling me at the city, at the county level, was that they can't financially provide for him because of the fact that we can't, we don't qualify for the financial side of things. But I had no idea that there were private sector social social workers because I didn't know. I've never worked in healthcare before, um, never faced that before. So it just felt like a whole lot of push and pull. We encountered that a lot as well later when I said he needs med adjustments, but they will not keep him in the facility. They'll kick him out if he undergoes those under the facility there. And they said, well, we can send him off to get med adjustments at the dementia. I think, I can't remember the name of the place, but there was a place that specifically handled dementia there, but he was too young and they wouldn't take him there, but that's where he should have gone if he had been old enough. But he was too too young and too busy for them to keep him there. Because he, part of part of frontal temporal dementia is super hyper, hyperactivity, cannot stop moving, cannot, I mean, we hired young college kids to come take care of him at one point and they could not keep up with him. So. That's a huge challenge in itself. I mean, they thought they were going to sit around doing homework and they literally would put on 12,000 steps in their shift because they were so busy chasing him. Um, so there's just, it, there was not really a good place for him. Um, all of the facilities that you look into have minimum ages of 55. He didn't qualify for um, for the nursing home because he didn't, he wasn't, he had too much mobility at that point. So there was just, it was just nonstop everywhere I went. I had to, constantly be calling people back and trying to figure this all out while working full time with four young kids. And it was just crazy and it was exhausting. And I felt like 
every choice that I made was always going to be the wrong choice because nothing was set up for him, especially not at his age. And I want to say that nothing is still set up for that. Uh, you know, I've been doing advocacy for going on eight years now, and I can't say that too much has changed. They still are in that mindset of dementia is an old person's disease. Uh, that, that That's all they're going to take at a facility. Uh, I always recommend to people, Amy found that uh, hiring a social worker help, but palliative care is available to anyone with any dementia at any age as soon as they're diagnosed. And at least it gives you that care team. So it gives you that like care management that Amy was seeking. Where do I go? What do I do? Who do I talk to? They have the resources that are able to at least help you along that way. So I always recommend palliative care in the beginning as well. And the other reason for that is that Everything that's based on dementia is based on Alzheimer's. It's the elephant in the room. And so the qualifications for hospice are Alzheimer's. Our people can be singing and dancing the day before they pass away, but they're very progressed in their disease. So when you have a palliative team on board, they see the progression and they will intervene and say, I think you're ready for hospice which gives you a lot of additional services and a lot of a lot less financially burdensome. So it's so financially burdensome. I just want to say that, you know, people think, oh, well, you know, you know, you put them in a home and Medicaid pays for, well, excuse me, but here again, we've got a young person. When you go on social security disability, you have to wait a full two years for Medicaid. So. Amy had to work to keep her children insured, to keep him insured. That Those are things that people don't think about. And you have to wait two years and you wait six months for benefits. And that needs to be changed because they keep looking at dementia as an old person's disease. And until we change that framework, that this can hit at any age, and we even have people that are in their 20s with, with uh, FTD. And maybe they get diagnosed sooner than their 30s, but, you know, 20s, it, it just, and a lot of those are misdiagnosed. FTD is the highest rate of misdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. So many people with FTD are primarily, they're primarily diagnosed up front with bipolar, or as Amy said, schizoaffective disorder, or schizophrenia, or depression. Those are the big ones, because that's what when you go to a therapist and say something's wrong here it's what they know they don't know neurology could be involved so that that's where you get stuck in this rabbit hole but young onset anything if you're under the age of 65 it's a big black hole and it costs you twice as much as alzheimer's alzheimer's people have already built up their 401k, their retirement, they've been in the same job, they're older, so they've got a little nest egg uh, that they have. When you're 30, what'd you say, 36, right, yeah. Amy? Was it 36? Yeah, 36 when he was diagnosed. What kind of nest egg did you have at 36? I don't think you had much. Plus you have four children under the age of six. What kind of nest egg can you accumulate? So these are people that are left financially destroyed by the system, because the system thinks that dementia is for all people. And it's for people that are sitting in a wheelchair and can't remember their family. It's not for somebody that is withdrawn from their, from their normal activities, maybe has aggression, maybe is drinking a lot, maybe is gambling a lot. Uh, sexuality, hypersexuality is huge. And so you have affairs, you have all this stuff going on that no one associates with dementia. And that, that dialogue has to change. That has to change. And it's still there. It's still prevalent, even amongst professionals. It is still prevalent. Well, Sharon, we're changing that dialogue today. Thanks to the two of you, we are changing that dialogue. Amy, I'm going to ask you, 
in your opinion, what else can healthcare and social services do better? Well, I'll kind of piggybacking off of what Sharon was saying. I think the biggest struggle for me was that I felt like no one believed me because it's just not possible. Even when I went to the first psychologist, he had looked at me and he just thought I was lying because I, I told him I'm, he doesn't even drink. He doesn't like beer. He doesn't like, he, he doesn't drink. He's never done drugs. He won't even, he's never even tried a cigarette before. He's never been in an accident, like there, none of these things. And he just looked at me like, that's not possible. Like you're, he's hiding something from you. You obviously just don't know. And I'm like, I'm not kidding. I'm with him all the time. We work at the same place. Like we are home with the kids. Like we literally drive to and from work every day. There's no possible way. There's something else that I'm not getting here. Um, but I'd go to all these other places too. And it would just, they did kind of look at me like I was stupid or like, I didn't know really what I was doing or they were just brushing it off like it wasn't a big deal. And I'm like, I am not a weak personality. If this was minor, I would be dealing with it. I am a strong personality. If I am in your office crying, there is something severely wrong here. And it just felt like there was nobody knew. And I, that was one thing that was really surprising to me was how little the different types of doctors knew about each other's profession. Like, my doctor, my family practice, and I know it was a small town, but he didn't even know to send us to a neurologist. He didn't even think of that. When the MRI came back normal, he's like, I don't even know what to do from here. I have no idea. The last person that something similar to this happened with was they had a, they had a, uh, a brain, what's it called? A tumor. And we removed it and he was fine. And I'm like, oh, that's what it's going to be then. Good. But then that wasn't it. And he didn't know what to do. And so it was my therapist who suggested neuropsych testing. Like, it just does they don't all just know it didn't just come naturally it wasn't something that even came up in his mind and it's actually very interesting because he contacted me a couple of years ago and said he had another patient that he believed had this and he had a few questions for me um because my husband was diagnosed he knew in this small town so i i've just been really shocked by how little within the healthcare industry they know about each other and what each other knows or who to send who to and you know, is this, you know, is this a psychological issue? Is it a neurological issue? You know, how do we know what the difference is? And how do you even know which questions to ask? And I felt like they were looking at me like I was some sort of an expert in this. And I'm like, I have no, I Googled this stuff. I have no idea, <laughs> you know, but to look at me, to look at, and I've seen that with many of the FT, I'm, I'm good friends with many of the younger FTD spouses. And so many of them have the same story where they say, these people look at me like I'm trying to pull one over on this man and steal his money and run. And the truth of the matter is like, I'm going broke and he's ruining my life and I don't know what's going on. And you're looking at me like I'm the problem. <laughs> like I'm trying to get help here and you, it was, it's a, it's maddening. It's maddening and it, and it just leaves you completely drained just from that alone. And then you go home and you're dealing with a full-time job and it's just these kids and the kids, that's a whole different avenue. I don't even know if we'll get to that today, but that's a whole different avenue where you're expected to parent kids that are being traumatized daily and trying to figure that all into this whole mix too. And, and nobody seems to really care about that. You, they want to, I think on some level, but they just, they can't go home at night and think about that kind of stuff. So they just kind of brush you off, push you aside, tell you we'll see you in a month. That's such an important important point and and obviously we have a lot of education to do uh on ftd sharon gosh what do you want our listeners to know about this disease that we may not have covered yet because you're just both of you are storehouses of information i i do think that some areas are getting better about young onset and and i think I think we need to make sure that if if this enters your life, you need to be like Amy and speak out. Uh, that's what makes it visible to people. When you speak out, a lot of times people don't want to talk about it. Some of the behaviors that happen with FTD in public can be embarrassing, but you have to get over that and you have to say, I'm sorry, he has FTD. I try to always carry some information and hand it out uh, because if we don't let them know, then it's not going to happen because unfortunately, physicians sometimes are very 
reticent to listen to patients and to listen to spouses like Amy who's going, I know everything about this man. I'm with him 24-7, and I'm telling you there's something wrong. And they go, yeah, right, you know, you're just trying to, you've got four kids and you're getting tired and you, you just went out of this. And, uh, and like she said, uh, you want his money and run. The number of people divorced before a diagnosis is staggering. And a lot of times the spouse will take them back after they find out, after they've progressed enough that somebody went, whoa, something's wrong here. Uh, when they've progressed to that point, you see a lot of spouses that take that other spouse back and let's also be clear that even though Amy and I are both female this is equal between men and women uh, it's a little slanted towards men but it's equal between men and women so uh, and I think a lot of times maybe women don't get as diagnosed as men do because I think women are more persistent in saying this isn't the man I married where men are going by chick and off they go and uh and nobody really finds out and that person may be diagnosed bipolar that woman because she really gets stuck in psychology the women with ftd get really pushed into psychology because you know we're all women and we're like flaky and so obviously it's psychological so there's a lot of you need to question. You need to constantly question. You need to constantly, if you are in the FTD community, talk, 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 talk. There are people who won't even let their family know. And I understand it's a personal decision, but then you can't complain that nobody knows FTD because you are FTD. It is a family disease. Everybody needs to talk about it. And if it's not you, it needs to be the people around you saying, oh my goodness, did you hear that Mark Johnson has dementia? That starts a conversation. Mark Johnson, he's so young. So that's what makes this get better and get involved and let people know that this is a disease for young people. And it happens with Alzheimer's as well. In fact, they did a study uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield did a study and between 2014 and 2017, young onset dementia was the number of people diagnosed increased by 300%. And that's a Blue Cross Blue Shield study, not just us saying it. So it, it's, it's there and people are not recognizing it. And like Amy said, you have to be extremely persistent you do not let go. You have to be like, like Amy and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. And Sharon, you bring up a great point about gender bias in healthcare. And episode one of Us Versus Them, we go into that topic. So I would urge everyone to, to take a listen to that as well, because this plays a factor, a role here as well. Amy, I'm going to come back to you again. What do you want our listeners to know that about this disease? Because you have such a unique viewpoint of it. You know, I feel like when I found out that Mark had FTD and I started talking about it more, mainly because when he was fired, it was a pretty big deal and people thought he was cheating on me and they thought he was a horrible person. And I realized like he, I need to say something so that people understand that this wasn't him. It wasn't him, it was a disease. I think that is one thing that is really difficult is to remember that it is a disease, it's not a person. And I still struggle. I still struggle two years, two and a half years after he passed away to remember that, that he didn't do this to me, the disease did it to him. And um, that's really, really difficult. But there are so many people that came forward after I said that and said, oh yeah, well, I never wanted to hurt your feelings, but there was this incident. Oh, there was this thing that he said. There was this, and I feel like, there were so many of those that it was so overwhelming to me that I feel like if I had heard these stories sooner, I would have known more. At that point, I didn't see him during work all day. I worked in a different part of the building. I didn't see him. And when we were together, we were with kids all the time. And so I was busy work, working on the, working, focusing on the kids. Had I had people continuously come up to me and say, you know, hey, I had this interaction with him and he said something really weird. You know, if I had had those people coming forward sooner, I think it would have helped. I would have known sooner. I would have realized it sooner. Um, had someone said, like, hey, he's, he's out there, you know, like, 
you know, doing little donuts in the parking lot right near a whole bunch of kids. Like, that's not characteristic. That's not a normal experience. You know, if you said, hey, I saw him out with the kids and he was, you know, not paying any attention and they were running away a long ways away, I would have said, hey, wait a second. I didn't know that was happening. Um, I didn't know about any of these things afterwards. My kids came up with stories after the fact. So to me, it's it's important to recognize that if there is really bizarre behavior by somebody that you have experienced not being bizarre before, say something to the people well, closest to them so they're aware of these things going on. I'm, I'm not blaming any of the people. I mean, I should have seen it myself too, but it just, what I missed out on by not having a sooner diagnosis was special time with my husband and my kids that I thought I was going crazy and I felt I, I was crying myself to sleep every night. I didn't sleep for longer than two to three hours a night for months because I was so distraught and thought there was something wrong, but I didn't know what was wrong. And I thought I was envisioning it wrong or I had different expectations. If I had known that's what this was, I would have had a chance to talk to him about what do you want to do? I would have had a chance to have him, you know, leave messages for the kids or write cards for the kids when he had those moments of he still had compassion, he still had you know, those things about. I would, have, I would have had some more special times with him. By the time we started doing weekly date nights because we waited so long, they were super weird and very bizarre and I didn't want to even go <laughs> um, because it was all these strange encounters in public that I had to deal with. There's so many dangerous things. The erratic driving is huge. In fact, that was one of the first questions that my the neurologist upon diagnosis said, Have you are you still letting him drive? And I said, I've been tempted to take it away for a long time. Um, very dangerous, very dangerous. And it's something that is a very hot topic, um, both sides in FTD communities. You know, you don't want to take their driver's license away. You don't want to take their car away. Um, but they can't they can't drive properly. They, they're not safe. I, I, I personally think how many accidents out there are caused by this, how many suicides are caused by this, how many, um, you know, people living on the streets are caused by this, and nobody would know because you wouldn't think about this because they look like they're just some deadbeat, you know, 25-year-old kid, and we just let them all go. On that note, the prison population it's estimated that at least 20% of the prison population actually has FTD because they've been incarcerated for drunk driving, for drugs, for fighting, all those th gambling, all those things that are symptoms, they've been incarcerated. We have people who were diagnosed because they were incarcerated. So it, it, that, that's a huge problem as well. And in fact, there's someone here in Georgia, at Georgia State, that's doing some research on dementia and incarceration because people just don't think that behavior is part of dementia. They always think it's memory and people need to get away from that train of thought. And Sharon, that's a great point. And we've got an upcoming episode on Us Versus Them that discusses FTD in our prison population. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a breathtaking discussion, and I urge everyone to, to listen to that podcast as well. Uh, once you've learned a whole lot uh, today about FTD from uh, our marvelous guests. So I, I'm going to conclude with a question for both of you. Uh, uh, Sharon, I'm going to start with you. How can we move the needle on this issue? What's it going to take? Is it advocacy? Is it education? What is it that we can do collectively? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. is it, it takes a village. Uh, those that have FTD in their family need to talk about it. Those that are friends of somebody that has someone with FTD, you're not talking behind their back. They have a disease. You would, you would not hide that someone has passed away from liver cancer. You shouldn't hide that someone has passed away from dementia. It is a neurodegenerative disease. So we need to get that stigma of it being just because it has to do with the brain doesn't mean you can control it. And, and that's, that's a huge thing. So talking about it is the best thing anybody can do. Advocating at the federal level, at the state level, to make them understand that this is not Alzheimer's and stop calling all dementias 
Alzheimer's. If you have only used the word Alzheimer's in explaining dementia, shame on you. Because it's so much more than that. And that needs to change. And you also need to advocate for that to change. So talking about it, sharing your stories, all of those things are important. And, you know, God love Bruce Willis's family for coming out and saying that uh, they eventually said he has frontotemporal dementia. He has obviously the primary progressive type because it was a language issue at first. But that helped a lot. In fact, my husband now will say to people, I have FTD, but just like Bruce Willis, but I had it first. <laughs> oh, Amy. Like it's a badge of honor. <laughs> it, it is, definitely. But, Amy, yeah, I'm going to talk, 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 talk. I'm going to let you. Wherever you are, talk. That, it's such an important point. Amy, I'm going to let you have the last word today. Uh, and um, give us your perspective on what folks can do, what our listeners can do as a group. I think the biggest thing that I needed in my journey was compassion and to understand that I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any clue. I was trying. I was grasping at everything. And you know, you'd have people seeing the behaviors and I'm telling you what, there, there are some very bizarre, they, they do some, <laughs> a lot of people with that you do some very bizarre things. And it is, it is comical. Like we had a lot of us in the caregiving, we have to kind of sit back and chuckle and laugh about it because we're like, we're going to cry. We're going to fall apart if we don't, <laughs> there's no other way around it. But to sit back and, and recognize that we don't need to be this ostracized group that we just sit back at a distance from and just watch and observe and comment about. Um, but to find, find ways, I mean, and I, I've been asked this so many times, you know, how do you help? What, what can we do to help? How can we help you? And the hardest thing is, is that most of the time, what caregivers need, what the families need and what the, what the people need is to be treated like human beings, even when they're not acting so much like that. You know, when you have a grown adult man who is acting like a toddler or like a young child or a teenager, because they're. You know, it's been very, very fascinating experience for me raising children as he was declining. Very interesting because there was a marked point where he declined in mental capacity past where my six and seven and eight year olds were. And, and it was very clear um, where his behavior, my kids started questioning it. Um, and, and I think I remember taking him for walks in the mall and people just, it, it was like, you hear you hear that and, and and this is this is hurtful for me to even say but i remember seeing on his neuropsych test the word retarded and i remember thinking back to when i was in middle school and high school and we used to just sit around there saying that word like nothing like oh that retard what well, i can't believe you know and i think about that and i it, it crushed me i sat there involved for a long time because when i saw that kind of behavior in my grown adult husband and thought that's exactly, we would have made fun of you in middle school for acting that way. We would, that crushed me. And instead of ever thinking about trying to help a person or be kind to that person or have compassion on that person and think maybe they're going through something, we'd make fun of them and belittle them and put them down. And um, that, that to me is, that, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. And I think to be able to come back as a whole, the people that I hired to care for my husband in the end, were, were tremendous people and they treated him with dignity and respect and kindness, even when he was acting completely crazy. And I get that. But um, if, if there's something that seems wrong, you know, Sharon, like Sharon said, we have to do everything. There's, there's, there's so hard to pinpoint what individual things, but I think the, the bottom line is we need to be understanding of situations. The second thing I would, I would really say is, to be more flexible with what's available. There are there was a long period of time where I was required to hire a one-on-one -on -one caregiver at the cost of $32 an hour out of my own pocket because he had he had he actually was one of those crazy people who saved a ton of money when he was young for whatever reason. So we had the funds to pay for his care, but it was $28,000 a month out of pocket for him to stay there. And um you know, to be able to have locked a door legally locked a door within a facility and not allowed him to leave his room for a period of time doesn't work for everybody 
that would have saved me about $12,000 a month. But it was illegal. We can't do that. And there's no way to circumvent these things. And to be able to say, this is a situation that's unique. What can we do? Would have been a really big deal. So I'm not saying that works for everybody. I'm not saying, but he would have been perfectly content to sit in a room by himself with a TV and snacks. But instead he was allowed to out roam the halls because it's illegal to lock him in. So things like that, and I, everybody is different. Everybody would require different things, but to have an understanding that everybody's situation is gonna be different. And can we take this disease and say, it's gonna be so bizarre and so different. Can we treat it a little differently? Because locking him in a facility where he can leave his room, but he can't leave the facility with a whole bunch of 90 year old grandmas that doesn't sound like a great solution to me. No, it does not. Now, I want to thank the both of you for sharing such very personal and heartfelt stories today and for your incredible advocacy uh, in the FTD community. For my listeners, please share what you've learned today with your networks. It's so important. And join us next time on Us Versus Them, 